want to share with you this morning is called the 10 10 life the 10 10 life so i want to ask you this morning are you ready to live a 10 out of 10 life okay do you know what a 10 10 life is okay that is what a 10 10 life is it is a life where you say you know if i would rate my life my life is 10 out of 10 okay it is 10 out of 10 so um we'll get back to that but first thing this morning that i want us to do is to just take a look at this clock just take a look at this clock on the screen What do you see? Can you see how the seconds are passing by? So seconds become minutes. Minutes becomes hours. Hours becomes days. Days become weeks. Weeks become months months become years and before you realize it all of a sudden years have passed by and maybe you know for the young ones among us you are 20 30 40 60 80 and the blessed ones among us 100 years old and your life is gone the point that I want you to notice with that clock is that time does not stand still. Did you notice since I was speaking that clock kept on moving? Time does not stand still. Time waits for no man or woman. So the question is not where the time will pass, but because time is always passing, the question actually is how will you spend the time that passes? How will you spend it? I don't know if you've noticed, but there are only 335 days left over of this year already. So it means that 30 days have already passed. I don't know of you, but it, looked, it seemed to me like those, that time has passed quickly. And 30 days is already gone. Now I'm turning 44 this year, and if I'm honest with you, I can't believe it. Where did all the years go? Now, I'm not having a midlife crisis. I don't, don't, don't worry, I'm not having a midlife crisis. But it does make you think, doesn't it? It does make you think. So, to give you some perspective this morning, I want to share some statistics with you about what they say the average life expectancy of people in America is. Okay, so in America, the average life expectancy is 78.6 years. 78.6 years. Now, in South Africa, you want to know what the average life expectancy is. I'm afraid it's not good news. The average life expectancy of a South African is 62 years. Okay, but praise God, we are not statistics. Okay, can I have an amen? Okay, so, you know, I believe that we will stay here until Jesus returns to rapture the church, or that we have lived full lives where we say, you know, I'm ready to go home. But for illustration purposes, I want to show you how the average South uh, American, and I believe also the average South African, spends their time. Okay, so how does that, of that years that we live, how do people spend their years? Now listen to this. They spend 28.3 years sleeping. Okay, just tap the person next to you and say to them, wake up. Okay, if you're still sleeping, it's now time to wake up. Now it's not the time to sleep. Okay, and then they spend another 10.5 years working. Okay, they also say that they spend 9 years watching television. Okay, playing games or being on social media. Okay, maybe some of you can say, oh, uh, that's not my wife, that's not my husband. They spend a little bit more time doing that. Okay, and then, this might shock you, you spend four years eating. 
Okay, four years of your life, and then obviously some people a little bit more. Um, and then 2.5 years of grooming, getting ready to go somewhere. And um, even though I can see some of you definitely spend a little bit less time doing that. And then others I can see you actually spend, some of the beautiful ladies, you spend much more time doing that. Um, and uh, then some of the ladies, maybe this might also shock you, 2.5 years shopping. And all the men say? <laughs> I think it's more actually. Okay, that's an underrated statistic. Okay, so that's just to show you some perspective on, um, on how people spend their lives. But that actually just only leaves us with nine years to live your dreams. Nine years. Doesn't sound a lot, does it? Okay, but if you're a, a, a South African, according to statistics, which we are not, it's even less, I'm afraid. 1.7 years to live your dreams. Okay, but we are not statistic once again. Okay, alarming, isn't it? Did you hear that alarm? Okay. Well, the purpose of an alarm is to wake us up. That's the purpose of an alarm. So I want this morning to us to wake up to the reality that we don't have time to waste. We don't have time to waste. We don't have another hour to, to kill. We don't have another morning to snooze. We don't have another year to squander. Uh, if time is precious. And every moment that we spend wasting our time, whether we realize it or not, we are actually wasting our lives. So, I want to ask you this morning, are you living? Are you living or are you just existing? Are you living or are you just existing? So listen to what Jesus Christ said. I refer to the scripture and the offering as well. It says in John 10 verse 10, it says, The thief does not come except... To steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Listen, like I said, I believe and I'm aware that the last two years the devil has stolen, he has killed, he has destroyed many things in people's lives. But the question is, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Are we going to stop living because of that? No. We cannot stop living because of what the devil does. So I want us to read that scripture again. But I want you to see something that the Lord has shown me in that scripture. And it's something so amazing that I think we sometimes miss. It says, Jesus said, The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But did you notice something? What is after the destroy? Say again. Full stop. Full stop. So it needs to stop. I believe there's a full stop there because God is saying it needs to stop. It is over. It is done. Why? Because He has come so that we can have life and have it more abundantly. And like the passage translation says it, it says, I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness, until you overflow. The Amplified Classic says, I came that you may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. And the message says, I came so that they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. Abundant life, overflowing life, real life, eternal life, life that is better than we ever dreamed of. Does that describe my life? Does that describe your life? If not, then I think it's time that we stop existing and that we start living that life. And not just any life, but a 10 out of 10 life. A 10-10 life. So I'll call it 10-10 life because it's John 10-10 life. 
Okay, life filled with the life of Jesus. A life filled with the abundant, overflowing life of Jesus. A life of purpose, on purpose. So, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 says that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. No eye has seen, no ear has, um, sorry, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. So let me ask you this morning, does God love you? Do you believe God loves you? Okay, your mind has not imagined it. Your eyes have not seen it. Your ears have not heard the amazing things that God has prepared for you. You see, God has prepared an extraordinary life for you. Not just an average life, but an extraordinary life. But I think it's time that we take Him up on the offer. Don't you agree? It's an abundant, overflowing, real, eternal life that is better than any life that you've ever dreamed of. Now, I know that that is how I want to describe my life as well. But what I'm talking about here, just for clarification purposes as well, I'm not talking about a perfect life. And that's not what Jesus is talking about either. Okay, He's not saying that your life will be perfect. He's not saying that you will never have trouble, that you will never have difficulties. That you will never have trials. That you will never go through storms. Okay. It's actually that Jesus said in John 16, 33. He said in this godless world. You will continue to experience difficulties. Okay. Does that sound to you like good news? No, it doesn't. But listen to what Jesus said. But take heart. Say to the person around you. Take heart. I have conquered the world. So even though all these things are happening, God says, I have conquered the world. He's already conquered the world and He's conquered it on your behalf. So in the difficulties, thank God, Jesus has conquered the world for you. Okay, but also, this is not just a life that is about money. Okay, sometimes people think when we talk about the 10 out of 10 life, immediately the first thing that comes to their mind is it's all about money. No. It's not all about money. Yes, God wants to bless you financially, but that's not the only part of life that exists. You see, Jesus said that we are not to just go from experiences of one emotional high to the next. You know, you know, you fluctuate, then you're happy, then you're sad, happy, sad, and people aren't constant in life. And that is not what this life is all about. Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30, Jesus in the message says it beautifully as well. He says, are you tired? Okay, are you tired? Are you worn out? Burnt out on religion. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, come to me. Get away with me and you will recover your life. You will recover your life. God wants you to recover your life. And then he says, I'll show you how to take a real rest. How many of you could use a real rest? You know, not one of those where you go on vacation and you come back and you're even more tired than you were before you went on vacation. Okay, a real rest. Okay, a real rest. He says, walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Doesn't that sound amazing? Doesn't that sound to you like a 10-10 life? A 10 out of 10 life. It's a life that is recovered. A life of rest in Him. A life of living freely and lightly. Like Jesus said in John 10, verse 10, it's so a life. It's Zoe life. The, the word there is Zoe. And that Zoe life is life that is infused with vitality. Life that is infused with vitality. The vitality, the life of Jesus. It's His absolute fullness of life. His absolute fullness of life. It's life that is real. It's life that is genuine. It is life that is active and vigorous. It is life that is devoted to God. It's a blessed life. 
So once again, does that describe our lives? Does that describe our lives? Now, to live this type of life, I want to say this morning, that life doesn't just happen by accident. Okay, it doesn't just happen by accident. We have to be intentional about it. Okay, we have to be intentional about it. You know, sometimes people think, you know, I'm just going to sit back and, and everything is just going to happen. Okay, but we don't live an abundant, overflowing life, a real life, an eternal life that is better than we've ever dreamed of without being intentional about it. If we're not intentional about it, we're not going to live that type of life. So we have to be intentional. So let me ask you a question this morning. What if I say to you, maybe you have to, and this is not specific to anyone, but maybe you have to go to a doctor. And uh, just before you have to do the surgery, the doctor comes to you and this morning and he says to you, you know what, this morning, when I'm going to do your surgery, I'm just going to wing it. Okay, I didn't have time to study the procedure. I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm just going to show up and I'm just going to go with the flow. Okay, would you put your life in someone's hands like that? You wouldn't probably. Okay, so yet when we don't live intentionally, that is exactly what we do. We put our lives in the hands of fate and we don't have any direction, we don't have any purpose, any plan. So we're in actually saying in essence, we are saying, I'm just wishing that I will end up somewhere. I just wish I'm going to end up somewhere. I don't know, I'm not doing anything, but I'm just going to go with the flow, but I'm just wishing I'm going to end up somewhere. Okay, so let me ask you, how has that been working for you? Okay, but the reality is that everyone ends up somewhere. Okay, that's a given in life. You are going to end up somewhere. But listen to this. Few people end up somewhere on purpose. Everyone ends up somewhere, but few people end up somewhere on purpose. So will you just end up somewhere in your life? Or are you going to end up somewhere on purpose? The choice is yours. Now I know things, COVID made things crazy. But just like anything in life, we always have a choice. We always have options. The secret is actually is to be resilient. Now that's just a beautiful word to me. I had to use that this morning because it's a word that I heard and it just sprung up in my spirit. And I believe that we have to be resilient. You know what resilient means? It means the ability to withstand and recover quickly from difficult conditions. Okay, I'm preaching better than you are responding. Okay? It's the ability to withstand and recover quickly in difficult conditions. Okay, the ability, and I love this, to bounce back. Okay, so say to the person next to you, I'm bouncing back. I'm resilient. Okay, so no matter what you have been faced with and what you are facing, you can recover. Okay, do you believe that? You can recover. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19, once again out of the message says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I place before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life. Okay, so every morning when we wake up, there is life and death, blessing and cursing placed before us. And we have to choose what we will accept and what we will reject. Now listen to what I said to you. I didn't say that death isn't going to try to come. That curses isn't going to try to come. But what will you accept and what will you reject? Okay, accept the blessings. Accept the life. Okay, because when you do, you are actually rejecting the curses and you are rejecting the death. But you have to accept it in the midst of every situation. So that is why I believe this morning that failure and disappointment isn't fatal. What has happened to you in your life isn't fatal. Okay, if it was, you wouldn't be here anymore. 
Okay, so it wasn't fatal. So that means that you still have the ability to get up. You still have the ability to, to make a different choice. You still have the ability to say, I'm going to get up and I'm going to move forward. I'm going to bounce back. Now, I personally know of people who in the midst of this pandemic started businesses that are flourishing. Okay, I've learned, I know of people who have developed skills during the pandemic that has caused them to go to a net new level in their careers. I know of people who develop better marriages. I know of people who have developed better relationships. Okay, so did you notice the common denominator is everyone was facing the same thing, but there were different responses. Okay, because we have a choice, because we can choose. You know, we don't have to allow circumstances, and I'm not disregarding the difficulty of it. Don't misunderstand me. We see the difficulty daily. But as long as we're just focusing on these negative things, we will never get out of it. The only way that we will get out of it is if we make a choice to say, listen, I'm not going, allow, going to allow this to affect my life any further. I'm standing up. I'm moving forward. I'm being resilient. I'm going to bounce back and I'm going to live the life that God has for me. Can I have an amen? So in every situation, you have to choose life or you have to choose death. So once again, choose life. So how do you choose life? I think that is the big question. Now, I always believe that you choose life with a plan. Okay, with a plan. So, do you have a plan to live a 10 out of 10 life? Okay, let me first ask perhaps, how many of you would like to live a 10 out of 10 life? Okay, I believe all of us. So, to do that, we would have to have a plan. So, once again, would you invest in a business who doesn't have a plan? No. Would you get on an airplane with no destination? No. You see, you never see a sports team coach just telling the people to go on the field and saying to them, you know what, just wing it today. We don't have a plan, just wing it today. Okay, but if they do, what will actually happen? They will lose. You see, because the scary thing is that we need a plan. Someone once said, failing to plan is planning to fail. Failing to plan is planning to fail. The scary thing is that most people actually improvise through their life. You know, they just improvise. They, they, you know, whatever happens to them, they just respond. Okay, and then they wonder, why am I not getting anywhere? Why am I not making any progress? Well, once again, because failing to plan is planning to fail. Listen to this. Did you know that God is a planner? God plans things, okay? It's not unscriptural to plan because God is a planner. Isaiah 46 verse 8 to 11 from the message says, From the very beginning, telling you what the ending will be. God knows the beginning from the end. Does that sound to you like someone who has a plan? He knows the beginning and He knows the end. Okay? You, to have a plan, you need to know the beginning and you need to know the end. And listen to this, he says, all along letting you in what is going to happen, assuring you I'm in this for the long haul. I'll do exactly what I set out to do. <clears throat> Calling that, that, that eagle, Cyrus, out of the east from that far country, the man I chose to help me, I have said it and I'll most certainly do it. I've planned it as so it is as, as good as done. Okay, God planned it and He said it is as good as done. God has a plan and He's planned it and it is as good as done. So sometimes there is so much that we have to do in life that we become overwhelmed by life. You know, nothing seems to be working, but how do you overcome that? You know, I, I heard this and it, and it just stuck with me as well. We fight fear with a plan. We fight fear with a plan. You see, if you have all these things that you need to do, and you don't know where to start, and you don't know what to do, the best thing is not to run headfirst into it and try to do everything. The best thing is to go and sit back, to make a plan, and when you've made the plan, then you execute the plan. Okay? Because you fight fear with a plan. 
Okay, so by doing this, we're practicing a biblical concept. Psalm 33 verse 11 says, The plan of the Lord stands firm forever. The purposes of His heart throughout all generations. Okay, so once we have a plan, we can start to execute it. It's like someone once said, how do you eat an elephant? Bite for bite. Okay, and that's exactly, if you have an overwhelming situation and you don't know what to do, the best way to deal with it is to fight it, fight the fear with a plan, to fight it bite for bite. Okay, and before you know it, you have eaten up the whole elephant. Okay, so, um, so what is the plan? I think Pastor Michael said that this year is the year of focused love and simplified faith. Okay, so we have to simplify things. So how do you simplify things? Well, I believe the way to simplify things is to go back to the basics. Okay, just say basics. So the fundamentals of life, that is what the basics is. It's the fundamentals of life. Sometimes when things are in chaos and when they are in confusion, the best thing is to go back to the basic, to go back to the fundamentals. So, usually when we take care of the fundamentals, the rest actually takes care of themselves. It's because we lose grip on the fundamentals that we feel overwhelmed and confused and we don't know what to do. But when you consistently practice the fundamentals, then everything just seems to start to fall in place. So, I believe that there are five fundamental priorities in life. Okay, there are five fundamental priorities in life. So the first one is, and I think you know this one by now, it's a relationship with God. Okay, it's a relationship with God. That is a fundamental priority. The second one is relationship with people. Relationship with people. The third one is your financial life. Your financial life life. The fourth one is your physical life. It's your health. Okay? And the last one is your life's work. It's your life's work. So just for those who are taking notes, let me just repeat it. The first one is relationship with God, relationships with people, your financial life, your physical life, and your life's work. Um, Jan, can you just check for me, I think, on the memory stick, there's a, a slide that says the, the, the wheel of life. I don't know if I've put it on the... But you can just check for me there, you can just put it on perhaps if you find it. It's just a picture. So, but what that picture represents is basically, it's, um, it's the wheel of life. So I don't know if you've ever seen a wheel of life. How many of you have seen a wheel of life? Okay, so this is not a new age concept or something like that. It's just five spokes of a wheel. Okay, now these five spokes, every part of these five spokes actually represents an aspect of your life. And these fundamentals actually represent five spokes of the wheel of life. Okay, so on in your life you have your relationship with God, you have your relationship with people, your financial life, your physical life, your work life. So with all of these things, there's actually, it's like the wheel of a bicycle. If you've, have you seen the spokes on the wheel of a bicycle? So have you noticed that what happens while you're driving on a bicycle and this, one of the spokes comes loose? What happens? You fall very hard. Okay, if you're not careful, you can fall very hard. You can, uh, you can damage yourself in a very terrible way. But, you know, that's sometimes what happens because one of the fundamentals in our life is not in place, it's like one of those spokes and they come loose. And when they come loose, we fall in life. We fall hard. Okay? Because those things are not in place. So, you know, I want you to just think about it for a moment. There are five aspects there. Your relationship with God. Um, let me ask you from the beginning then. If you would rate your relationship with God from 1 to 10, how would you rate it? Okay, 1 being... Um, at a place where I don't think I have a relationship with God, then being my relationship with God is excellent. Okay, couldn't be better. Next, your relationship with people. One, between one and ten. How does your relationship with people look? Are you, I don't have any relationships with people or I have too many friends. Okay, I'm extremely blessed. Third, your financial life. How does it look? 
Are you happy with your finances or are you at the place where you are saying, I'm um, at the place of almost filing for bankruptcy? The fourth one, your physical life, your health. How are you doing? One to ten. One being, I'm not making it, I'm a dead stall. Or ten, I'm extremely healthy and full of energy, full of life. And the last one, your life's work. Do you feel that you are fulfilling your life's work? Okay, so that is all part of the wheel of life. Now I want you to just think about this in numbers. Say you have this wheel, you have all these different spokes. Now all of them you mark 1 to 10. So if you see that maybe your spiritual life is a 3, your finances is a 2, your um, health is a 5, your um, relationships with others is a, is, is a 2. Okay, so you see that that's, those spokes are actually a little bit uneven. Okay, so because the spokes are uneven, that's sometimes why we feel we're not getting any momentum in life. We're not moving forward, we're not reaching anything. It's because everything is not in balance. You know, I'm not having these fundamentals right, my life is not in balance, and I'm not moving forward in the way that I want to. Okay, so what do you do about that? Okay, if, if one of those areas, and that's what I want us to do this morning, maybe in one of those areas, maybe something has struck a chord with you this morning. Maybe you're thinking, you know what, I really want to this year, I want to work on my relationship with God. This year, I want to work on my, rela work on my relationship with people. This year, I want to wor work on my finances. This year, I want to work on my physical life, my health, my, um, my energy. Or maybe this year I want to work on my life's work. Okay? So the purpose of that wheel is for you to identify an area of your life that you would like to work on for this year. Because like I said, if we don't have a plan, we are planning to fail. And if you don't have a plan for all of these areas in your life, you are planning to fail in that area, by the way. If you don't have a plan for your finances, you are planning to fail in your finances. If you don't have a plan for your health, you are planning to fail in your health. If you don't have a plan to, to, to work in your work life, then you are planning to fail in your work life. You get the picture. So, the point is we need to look at these fundamentals. So, the first one that I want us to look at this morning, and that I'm going to discuss quickly, is a relationship with God. What does your relationship with God look like? So, to live a 10, 10 life, a relationship with God is required. There is no real life outside of Him. Like your lungs need oxygen and a fish needs water. We need God. Do you believe that? Acts 17.28 says, In Him we live and move and have our being. Did you hear that? In Him we live and move and have our being. How many of you remember the story of Goldilocks and the three bears? How many of you remember that? Okay, if you maybe you haven't heard it, I think then I don't know where you've been. See some um, even Tatu knows it this morning. Okay. So while the bears were out, Goldilocks, and you know the story, Goldilocks ate all the bears porridge. But listen to this Papa Bear's porridge was too hot. Mama Bear's porridge was too cold. But baby bear's porridge was just right. Okay, but listen to this. Jesus is nothing like Goldilocks. Okay, Revelation 3, verse 15 and 16, Jesus said, You are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You see, everyone, whether we like it or not, we fall into one of these three categories in our relationship with God. You are either hot, you are cold, or you are lukewarm. You see, hot means that you are growing in your relationship with God. Cold people are those who do not know God yet. Okay, cold people are those who do not know God yet. But lukewarm people are those who are drifting. You know, they have a relationship with God, but that relationship is drifting. They don't really, um, the relationship is fading. 
Hebrews 2 verse 1 says, and it warns us, it says, warns us, it says, we must pay more careful attention, therefore, that we have heard, to that which we have heard, so that we do not drift away. Do not drift away. So let me ask you this morning, what is your temperature? What is your temperature? If you are called, then it's time to make a choice and decide, I want my relationship with God to be 10 out of 10. I don't want to be called. We can't be called in this day and age that we are living in. We can't be called. William Booth said this was his commitment to God. And he was the, the founder of the Salvation Army. He said, I do promise God that I will rise every, every morning early to have a few minutes, not less than five, of active prayer. I hereby vow to read no less than four chapters in God's Word every day. I will cultivate the spirit of self-denial and I will yield myself a prisoner of love to the Redeemer of the world. Does that sound to you like someone who's hot or cold or lukewarm? Someone who's hot. So what is your goal for improving your relationship with God? Will you intentionally improve your relationship with God or will you just continue to be cold? What can you do to improve that relationship? You know, there's many ways. Don't limit God to just one or two ways. You can do it through Bible study, through prayer, through fasting, worship, fellowship with other believers, accountability, service, outreach. There's many ways where we can increase our temperature of our relationship with God. So what will you do to improve your relationship with God? What things should you stop doing? To improve your relationship with God. And you all know what I'm talking about. If there's something in your life that you need to stop doing, God is speaking to you. You know what you need to stop doing. So, you have to decide on what you want to do. You have to make a plan that is specific, that is measurable, that is achievable, realistic, and that is time bound. So, for instance, if you decide to spend more time with God, you have to say, I'm going to wake up in the morning at 5 o'clock. I'm going to read two chapters of the Word. I'm going to pray for five minutes, and I'm going to worship God. Okay? And by 6 o'clock, I will be finished. That is a goal. If you are just saying, I'm going to spend time with God, that is not a goal. And that is not a plan either. Okay, because you don't have a time, you don't have a place, and you don't have anything in place to do it. So that's the first one, your relationship with God. The second one is your relationship with people. You know, God has a purpose for relationships in our life. He is a God of relationships, and it's... The way that people treat each other, I think, is despicable to God. Don't you agree? You know, the way that people treat each other. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 9 to 10 says, Two are better than one, because they have a return for their work. If one falls down, the friend can help him up. But pity the man or woman who falls and has no one to help him. You see... God has a tempting life for our relationships. Okay, God has a tempting life for our relationships. He has people prepared that can mentor you. He has people prepared that can sharpen you. He has people prepared that can support you. Okay, He has friends for you. And listen, He even has a date for you. Okay, if you need one. Okay, but the point is, we may not think we need relationships, but God's greatest command, second to loving Him, is to love other people. That's God's greatest command. He said, love the Lord your God and love people. That's the two greatest commandments. So, if we want to live a 10 out of 10 life, we have to have God-ordained relationships and we have to love other people. So, for those relationships, you need to ask the following questions. The first one is... What relationships in your life needs to be initiated? Okay, we said sometimes you need a mentor, sometimes you need a friend. Whatever you need, you need to initiate that relationship. Okay, this the second one. What relationships need to be nurtured? What relationships have you been neglecting? You know, maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a, it's a parent, maybe it's a friend. You know, what relationships have you been neglecting? You need to 
nurture those relationships. You see, if we don't nurture those relationships, sometimes those relationships will grow stale, they will grow cold, and we will lose those relationships. Then the third one, what relationships need to be restored? What relationships in your life is broken, is damaged, is wounded? You know, sometimes we are offended by people and we can be so easily offended in these days. Okay, but sometimes we are the person who actually offends people. So we have to ask ourselves, what relationships do we need to restore? Who have we offended or who is offended by me? Colossians 3 verse 11 says this, it says, Bear with each other, okay, did you hear that? Bear with each other, forgive the grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. You all realize that God has forgiven you. He's forgiven us much. So, let me ask you this morning, who are we? To hold a grudge against another person that God has forgiven infinitely. Who are we? Who are we to keep on holding a grudge against people if God has forgiven them? If God has forgiven you? Matthew 5.23 says, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and they remember that your brother has something against you, Okay, did you hear that? Your brother has something against you. Not you have something against your brother. Your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, everybody say first. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. We are to be peacemakers. So listen to this. Forgiveness doesn't make them right. But it makes you free. Forgiveness doesn't make them right. And it doesn't mean also forgiveness doesn't mean that you have to take that person and live the same relationship that you had with them. But the purpose of forgiveness is so that your heart can be set free. You know, how many times have people not forgiven people and because of that, they walk around with this hate, this bitterness in their hearts. And as a result, you know, they are bitter themselves. Because the bitterness of that broken relationship is, is tearing them apart. So we have to be um, let go of that, of, that, of that unforgiveness. The Bible says in Romans 12 verse 17 and 18, it says, Live in peace with all people as far as possible. So as far as it is possible for you, live in peace with people. Okay, it's for you, it's for your own benefit. God says it for a reason. And then the last question that we need to ask about relationships is, what relationships need to be severed? Do you know that there are certain relationships in your life that you need to end? 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Okay, You become like those you associate with. Okay, someone once said, John Maxwell actually said this, he said, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. See, the people in your life, the people that you associate with, determine the person that you become. So sometimes there are relationships that we should sever. Some of those relationships are perhaps unbiblical. They are relationships that you know that you should not be in. And I'm talking about this, he's not talking about your spouse, okay? So because God says that your spouse, you are devoted to your spouse. And if there's a problem, you sort it out. Okay, like Pastor Michael always says, and how uh, uh, MMI always says, it, well, there's five reasons for divorce. Do you know them? Selfishness. 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 Okay, but the point is marriage is a covenant. Okay, unless there is other grounds that is unbiblical. Okay, you know that the Bible says if someone is caught in adultery. Okay, that is one of the reasons why um, a person can divorce. But that, even with regards to that, okay, we can still sort it out if we want to. God's grace is enough for us. But 
There are relationships that need to be severed. And this is the relationships that I'm talking about. Wrong relationships with the wrong type of people. You know, if your relationship is hurting your relationship with God, then you have to let that relationship go. If your relationship is with a business partner who lacks integrity, then you have to let that relationship go. If you have a friend who spiritually drags you down, then you have to let that relationship go. If you have buddies who always trash talk their wives, then you need to let that relationship go. Ladies, if you have a relationship with, 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 with women who are man-haters, gossipers, backbiters, then you need to let those relationships go. You have to find another crowd. You see, why enjoy the thrill if you know where this relationship is leading? It's going to end up in destruction and it's going to end up destroying your life. So it will stop you from having 10 out of 10 relationships. The third one quickly is finances. So they say that statistics say that more than 75% of Christians live paycheck to paycheck. Okay, maybe post-COVID it's even more. South Africans are paying, and this is a statistic I saw last night, 77% um, of South Africans are paying, I'm sorry, South Africans in general are paying 77% of their income towards debt. Isn't that scary? We may not think it's spiritual to talk about finances, but two-thirds of Jesus' parables was all about possessions. In the Bible, 2,300 scriptures talk about money. 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 says, The love of money is the root of all evil. And Jesus said to us, You cannot serve God and mammon, which is money. So God wants us to own our hearts. But you know who's the greatest competitor for your heart? Money. It's the only one that Jesus compared himself to. He said, you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and money. So, what is your financial vision? How will your finances look one year from now? Are they going to be the same? Are you going to be in the same mix? Are you going to deal with the same problems? Or are we going to make a decision and say, listen, no more. It stops here. I'm sorting this out and I'm going to have a 10 out of 10 financial life. Then the fourth one, health and fitness. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 to 20 says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So say to the person next to you, my body belongs to God. Okay, when we read that in context, it actually is talking about not sharing your, your body with a harlot, not having sexual relationships outside of marriage. But your body still belongs to God. And we need to take care of our bodies. So what is your vision for your health? Do you have a vision? Okay, now this is also talking to me. So John Maxwell once told a story about how he experienced a heart attack. And um, after that, his perspective on life changed. He used to love desserts. And then he went to one of his friend's house and he had dessert with them. He had a dinner with them. And after the a dinner, the friend asked him, do you want dessert? And he said, no, thank you. And then the friend asked him, have you lost your craving for dessert? And John Maxwell answered him, he said, no. He said, my craving for life outweighs my craving for dessert. So, does your craving for life outweigh your craving for dessert? Are you going to have a tempting life in your health and in your physical body? And then the last one, do you have a vision for your work? Or are you just going through the motions? Do you go to day in, day out, filling empty hours and in a passionless purpose? Um, you get up, you go to work, you come home, you go to bed. And then the next day, you do it all over again. Ecclesiastes 2 verse 17 says, I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless and chasing after the wind. Is that how you feel about work? 
Does that describe your life? You are working 40 to 50 hours a week and it is grievous to you. It makes you hate life. It doesn't have to be that way. We can do work according to God's vision for our lives. We can do meaningful, purposeful work. And that's what Ephesians 2 verse 10 says. It says, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Listen, God has good work that is prepared in advance for you to do work that is fulfilling, work that is changing your life and transforming your life. So that is all to do with your purpose, discovering your purpose. I'm not going to go into that, but you remember I said if you want to discover your purpose, you have to find out what are your values. Okay, what do you value in life? What is most important to you? Secondly, you have to find out what is your spiritual gifts. Okay, and then you have to look at your past experiences in life. And when you look at the center of those three things, you will find your purpose right in the center of those three things. Okay? Your values, your spiritual gifts, and your past experiences, where they coincide with one another, that is where you will find your purpose. Because God placed all of those things inside of you in your life so that you can discover your purpose and that you can live on purpose and that you don't just exist, but that you live a 10 out of 10 life. So, in closing this morning, it is time to stop existing. It is time to start living. It is time to live a 10 out of 10 life. So I want to close this morning by asking you to just imagine something. So just there we are, just close your eyes. I want you to just think, it's the end of the year, of this year. It's 31st January, uh, sorry, sorry, 31st December 2022. And you are perhaps at an old year's eve party or a new year's eve party. And you are standing there and you're thinking to yourself, wow. This has been the most amazing year yet. You know, I haven't had a more perfect year than this. So what needs to happen for your life to be like that? For you to say that? And that's what I want to say to you this morning. In these fundamentals, you can open your eyes before you fall asleep. Uh, you can, in these fundamentals, choose a part of your life that you want to focus on, that you want to work on. Don't just go through the motions this year. Don't just think, at the end of, my, of this year, my life is going to be better. What do you need to do? What can you implement? What goals do you have? What vision can you have so that your life will look better at the end of this year than it's looking at this very moment? And it, the choice is in your hands. Okay? It's your choice. It's your life. You only have one life. It is your choice what you are going to do with it. But you have to make a choice. Okay, and listen to this. Also, not making a choice is also a choice. Just going through the motions is also going to end up in the same place. You know, Jan was saying it this morning again. It's one of my favorite quotes. If you keep on doing the same thing and you expect different results, it is called insanity. Okay, so make a different choice. Make, choose a different destination and by the end of this year you will end up in a different uh, place that God has for you. Let's pray. Father God, I come this morning and I thank you for every single person that was here this morning. Thank you for them being here and I know that this message was for them this morning. Lord, you want them to live a 10 out of 10 life. But Lord, I know to live that 10 out of 10 life we sometimes have to wake up. We have to wake up and we have to wake up to the reality, Lord, that life is passing us by. Moment by moment, second by second, life is passing us by. Lord, we're not going to be here forever. But the question that we need to ask is, what will my life look like after another day, after another week, after another year? What will my life look like? But the choice is ours. Lord, you say to us this morning once again, I put before you life and death. I put before you blessing and cursing. And you are saying to us, choose life. So what will you choose this morning? What will you choose this morning? I believe that the presence of God is here this morning to motivate you, to strengthen you. 
to let go of, of, of the sinful things, to let go of the wrong things of the past, to let go of whatever has been holding you back, and to focus on that which is ahead. God wants to release you from your past, and He wants to release you into your future, into the bright future that He has for you. So Father, this morning, I cut people loose from their past, from that which has happened in the past. And Lord, I pray that you will release them into their future, into the plan and the purpose that you have for their lives. And Lord, that you will show them what they need to do, what they need to work on, so that this year, they will stand at the end of this year, and they will say, this has been the most amazing year in my life, and I give all the glory and the honor to God for that. And we thank you for that, Father. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.